live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. We've seen players get suspended for a bunch of different reasons. You got players getting suspended for violating the league-wide drug policy, or for doing something on the field that isn't allowed, or for violating a team policy, whether it's missing practice or getting into an altercation with a coach or a teammate. However, there are some suspensions that are more bizarre than others. There are some suspensions that, when you consider how they played out, make no sense whatsoever, and where you can't find any good justification for the outcome being the way that it was. And in the over 60-year history of the Chargers franchise, this one has to be the winner. This is running back Sid Edwards. Yes, he's wearing a Cardinals uniform right now, but eventually, he would find his way onto the San Diego Chargers. When he started off in San Diego, he was one of the best players on the team, and one of the best at his position in the entire sport. When he ended, he was in the middle of an absolutely bizarre situation that even half a century later, I'm still not sure if it makes any sense whatsoever. In 1974, Sid Edwards got suspended under absolutely baffling circumstances. And this is the story behind that. Before I talk about the suspension, we need some context to understand who Sid Edwards is, how well he was playing, how important he was to the Chargers, and why everything went down in the first place. As I mentioned earlier, for the first four years of his career, Edwards, an undrafted running back out of Tennessee State, would play for the St. Louis Cardinals. He was part of a pretty solid backfield over there that, in 1970, finished sixth in rushing yards. You had Edwards, Johnny Rowland, and MacArthur Lane, and all three of them were pretty good players. As a side note, I did a video about MacArthur Lane and his career, so if you want to learn more about him, then click the card in the upper right corner. However, after a somewhat disappointing 1971 season, where Edwards averaged a career worth 2.9 yards per carry, and fumbled 8 times on 120 touches for an abysmal average of 1 every 15 touches, the Cardinals decided to get rid of him, and they shipped him off to the San Diego Chargers. San Diego finished 19th out of 26 teams the year before in rushing yards, and the Chargers were held to under 100 yards rushing in half of their games, so maybe Edwards could be the spark to that offense that the team desperately needed. And sure enough, he was. During the 1972 season, Edwards racked up a career-high 1,236 yards from scrimmage, finishing inside the top 10 of the NFL in this category. He also averaged 6.3 yards per touch, ranking second, only behind Chicago Bears quarterback Bobby Douglas. Edwards was a true dual threat during that 1972 season. Not only could he provide a spark in the running game, where he would plow people over, but he could provide a spark in the receiving game on short passes like screens and swings, where he'd catch the ball, and then plow people over. He had 679 rushing yards on 4.3 yards per carry, and had 40 receptions for 557 yards as well. To put his season into perspective, only two players in football that season had at least 600 rushing yards and 500 receiving yards. One of them was Atlanta Falcons fullback Art Malone. The other, Sid Edwards, meaning that Edwards was the only player in the AFC to accomplish this feat. After being cast away from the Cardinals, Edwards was so good in 1972 that he was named the team MVP on the offensive side of the ball. Unfortunately, everything was about to go downhill from there. Edwards had a solid 1973 campaign. While not as great as what he did in 1972, as his yards from scrimmage was cut by nearly 40% from 1,236 to 773, he still played well, averaging 4.6 yards per carry, finishing 8th in the league in that category. However, the Chargers were atrocious that season, going 2-11-1, which was the worst record in franchise history at the time. After making a mid-season coaching change, in 1974, they were about to bring in a new head coach to help change the identity of a team that had not made the postseason since 1965, and hadn't had a winning record since the merger. Enter a man by the name of Tommy Prothrow. Prothrow was the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams for two seasons, and did not make the playoffs either year. After starting 4-1-1 in his first season with the Rams in 1971, over the next 22 games, the Rams won just 10 of them, and he was fired after a 1972 season where the Rams finished below 500 for the first time since 1965. The story behind his firing is a topic for another video, because that was even the topic of a lawsuit. But regardless, in 1974, he was about to get another shot to lead an NFL team, when he was hired to coach the San Diego Chargers. And if he was expecting to be able to turn the team around in that first season, he was sorely mistaken, because the 1974 season was shaping up to be an absolute disaster. Through the first seven weeks at the halfway point of the season, the Chargers were 1-6, tied with a few other teams for the worst record in all of football. Their offense was atrocious, having scored a mere 93 points, or just a hair above 13 points per game. That was the fourth worst total in the NFL and the second worst total in the AFC, only ahead of the Baltimore Colts. The Chargers had multiple games in that stretch where they turned the ball over five times. And after winning two straight games to improve to 3-6, and six, that goodwill was wasted when the team lost two straight to drop 3-8 and eight and guarantee themselves a losing record, with the second of those losses being a 34-0 ambush at the hands of the Green Bay Packers. 
But at least by this point, despite the losing, it didn't seem like Prothrow lost the locker room. If he did, it wasn't public information at least. After that loss to the Packers, though, everything changed, and the main character in our story, running back Sid Edwards, was unfortunately caught in the middle of it. One day after the 34-0 loss to the Packers, Tommy Prothrow made moves by announcing that two players were going to be suspended indefinitely. One of them was defensive end Coy Bacon, although he would be reinstated two days later. The other one was Sid Edwards. You might be wondering what the reason behind the suspension of Edwards was. It was a perfectly reasonable and logical question to ask. Turns out, Prothrow never unveiled the reason. Not only that, but he never communicated the reason itself to Edwards. Prothrow just announced that Edwards was going to be suspended, and that was the end of it. As you can probably expect, Edwards was absolutely fuming at this. And after the suspension was announced with no public reason attached, Edwards wanted out of San Diego. He said in no uncertain terms, I've got to go someplace else. I can't play in San Diego anymore. He was livid at Prothrow. And while he probably had a lot of reasons to be, the main reason was his inability to communicate to his players, which came to light during this mysterious suspension. Edwards said, The man never communicates. From what I understand, his situation in college and in Los Angeles was just the same. You're just bodies to him. Eventually, we would find out the reason that Edwards got suspended. The reason was that he missed a team meeting on the day of that game against the Packers. But what made no sense about that is that if that was the case, then why did he dress for the game, and why did he play in the game? Keep in mind that from what I can tell, Edwards found this out from secondhand sources and not from Prothrow. Again, those are the communication issues at work that Edwards was harping on. You would think Edwards, if he missed a meeting for the Packers game, would be suspended for the Packers game and wouldn't be allowed to play. But that wasn't the case. But what's even crazier is that this is not the end of our story. Far from it, in fact. Because this same exact suspension was about to get a whole lot weirder for no logical reason. What's worse than not saying why a player got suspended? How about lying about the reason that the player got suspended? If you thought this situation already made no sense, get ready to be even more baffled. Edwards didn't play for the rest of the season, as he was in Prothrow's doghouse. And the reason that the Chargers gave for the suspension had nothing to do with the Packers game, but rather the fact that allegedly, Edwards was a bad influence on rookie fullback Bo Matthews, the man that the Chargers drafted in the first round of the 1974 NFL Draft. The Chargers were telling people that this was the reason why Edwards was suspended. Edwards thought it was for something completely different, and Prothrow never had the guts to directly reveal the reason to the public or tell it to Edwards' face. What made no sense about this, aside from the fact that the team was now lying about the reasoning for the suspension for some inexplicable reason, is that this lie, if taken at face value, destroys his trade value. I get it that Prothrow might not have liked Edwards and that Prothrow wants to bring in his own players and build the team from the ground up, especially since Edwards was on the wrong side of 30 at this point. But let's think logically for a second. If you're trying to trade Edwards and get something in return, which do you think another team or coach, when looking at red flags, is going to weigh more heavily and dissuade someone for trading for him? Edwards missing one singular meeting, as he had no prior history with this, or Edwards being a bad influence on the rookies and a potential locker room cancer? So not only did Tommy Prothrow lie about the suspension, and not only did he lose a ton of credibility in the locker room and in the public eye, but he did it for a reason that never, in a million years, would have benefited himself or the team. At this point, Edwards' mission, besides getting out of San Diego, was to clear his name for something he did not do. Edwards said that this was a giant smear campaign, and said, I'm going to clear my name. My suspension was nothing but a form of intimidation. A lot of people think Sid Edwards was involved in something bad, and he wasn't. So just to recap where we are at the end of the 1974 season, Edwards is suspended for a completely different reason than the one the Chargers are telling people, and Prothrow has no idea how to communicate any of this, even though he could very easily clear the air with one or two sentences. This suspension truly was strange. As for how it would all play out, well, neither side really got what they wanted in the end. The good news for Edwards was that in 1975, he found himself on the Chicago Bears, after Chicago made a trade during the NFL draft to get him. Somehow, the Chargers were able to get a third-round pick out of him, so that means that either Edwards was incredibly successful in clearing his name, or that the Bears had no idea what they were doing giving up that high of a pick for a runner in his 30s who was on his way out anyways. Maybe it's a bit of both. However, even though Edwards was out of San Diego, he did nothing in Chicago. He played one season there, scoring this one touchdown, and that was it. Edwards was out of the NFL by the end of the 1975 season. As for Prothrow, his time with the Chargers was not good at all. Shocker, I know. I'm not going to dive too much into that because I did a video about Prothrow a while ago, so if you want to learn more about him, then click the card in the upper right corner. But let's just say that when you're about to play a team and your motivational speech before the game is that you have no shot at winning the game, and your team goes on to lose 37-0, partially because you completely deflated your spirits, 
That should give you an idea of how good of a coach Prothro truly was. And this whole situation with Sid Edwards was just a microcosm of the mess and dysfunction that Prothro was involved with. What are the takeaways from this? If you're going to suspend a player, especially for an extended period like a three-game stretch, you better have a reason for suspending him. Even if you don't disclose the reasoning for the suspension to the public and just want to keep it in-house and keep it between the coaches and the team, you better at least communicate that reason. And if you're not going to communicate that reason, at the very least, don't lie about the reasoning and have people believe something that never happened, especially if everyone with a working brain can see that it's only going to backfire on you at the end of the day. Because Tommy Prothero completely botched the suspension, to the point where nearly 50 years later, it still lives in infamy as a prime example of how not to lead a team. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.